communities are the foundation of everything. Foundation of the economy, foundation of health, foundation of culture, foundation of peace. And when we have policies that rip apart communities, we destroy our society. And we have had such policies for many decades. The finding of food and the preparation of food is a community issue, you know, because, I mean, specifically if you live in urban environments, food has to be readily accessible. So my perspective on the neighborhoods like the Hill District is that they, they, they get formed by migration to the cities. Um, so there, there are small black neighborhoods in Pittsburgh and many other cities, but the, the populations grow substantially around World War I. A lot of African Americans moved into the Hill District from the southern part of the United States. And I think that Pittsburgh was probably a very desirable stop because there was plenty of work here, but it was also known because, you know, the Pittsburgh Courier was the largest circulating black newspaper. So people in the South, you know, found out about what was going on in Pittsburgh. You know, we, for us today, that's not a big issue. You know, we just turn on our computer and there we get, you know, news, but that wasn't the case at that time. Because of segregation, the people who moved um, into the Hill District was not just African Americans, was other immigrants too. So the immigrant, the settlement houses were in the Hill District, but other communities, other ethnic groups could leave, but the Jim Crow laws and the redlining laws did not allow African Americans to leave unless there were very specific kinds of places to go to. Segregation, when it gets imposed in the American city, it creates a, a substructure of defining areas where people can live by race. But this becomes refined by redlining in the 1930s. So redlining stratifies American cities into four strata. So at the top is the green, which is where white people live in new houses. And a fascinating thing in the redlining process was that they looked for places that had highly restrictive covenants, meaning Jews, foreigners, blacks, Hispanics couldn't move, couldn't move in. They were barred, however that had happened. Then the second is the blue, are areas where it's still white people, but not quite as new housing and not quite as good restrictive covenants. So the infiltration of undesirable racial elements was more possible. Under that, they have the yellow, which doesn't have restrictive covenants, older housing, and more of a mix of population. And at the bottom are where the concentration of these undesirable racial elements. Basically, this gets linked to the banking system, such that as opposed to investing in the places that are most vulnerable, they invest in the places that have the most already. When you have a segregated neighborhood, it means that a lot of the social life, a lot of the cultural life is confined within the boundaries, and it has to be in some way. Um, so, you know, which means that you often have kind of like a flourishing social life, which is what the Hill District was. Hill District was known um, as the crossroads of the world. Um, this is where, you know, um, the second Harlem Renaissance kicked off. This is where, you know, jazz greats have um, came and went. So I'm interested in where children go in the neighborhoods. So I'm interested in children's roaming spaces. And I wanted to find out if that had changed over the generations. And they were talking about uh, the communal structure in the Hill District at that time. So let's say in the 1940s, was a structure that was built around blocks. So they, the children particularly identified with their little block. But the blocks also did things to foster a sense of cohesion. So very often there were block parties. So everybody kind of talked about 
you know, the block party um, and the barbecue and the food, you know, that everybody had. So, you know, I think food played a really important role in cementing the community. In an intact community, poverty can be ameliorated by other people around it. And I've seen that also in other neighborhoods, you know, that in terms of food, but also in terms of child care, so those basic necessities, if there's a crisis in a family, if you have an intact community, the community kind of steps in. One of the great brainstorms <laughs> that urban planners had in the 1950s was they looked at these immigrant neighborhoods, most of them African-American neighborhoods, and said, wow, they're really close to downtown. So the, then they come up with the idea <clears throat> that the places that haven't had any investment from the 30s through the war years are blighted because they don't look good, so they don't have fresh paint, they haven't had updating of, of infrastructure, and they decide that they should destroy these neighborhoods. But, but these are neighborhoods that, however they look, have become socially and politically and culturally very strong neighborhoods. So many people agree that what they were really doing was destroying the growing political power, power of black people who lived in these near downtown neighborhoods. It was an economic center for black folks. You know, the Hill District is, you know, have built a lot of businesses and a lot of homes and they were self-driven, right? They had their own economic wealth. And what the city had done back in those days is destroy that. So in Pittsburgh, you have three major areas on the north side in the Hill District and in East Liberty where they do this. They're really ripping apart the city. They relocated 1,500 black families, which was 8,000 people. That's a lot of people. Uh, they destroyed, in 1956, 1,300 buildings. In 1956, that was the Lower Hill. They bulldozed everything. And so between then and the 1990s, the Hill District lost 38,000 people. And 400 businesses were destroyed um, in the 1950s and the 1960s. Urban renewal clears these huge tracts of land in, in the hill. They displaced 8,000 people um, and put in the Civic Arena. But they also put in highways and then the huge parking lot around the Civic Arena. So effectively, they wall off the hill district from downtown. But they also wall in downtown from the rest of the city. It's kind of a noose around the neck of downtown. And so downtown is enfeebled because downtown needs people coming and going. Um, but the Hill District is also enfeebled. So then you go into a period right as deindustrialization hits and people lose jobs. There's no other investment going into these neighborhoods and, and the poor neighborhoods fall apart. When you think about the Hill, part of what happens is that the ways to go in and out of the Hill are cut. So the incline is taken down, this highway cuts it off from downtown, bus lines are taken out. So the Hill becomes geographically isolated from the flow of the rest of the city. And it destroyed the block structure of the Hill District, which means, you know, that support system didn't work anymore. And a lot of the people were displaced into projects. So in the beginning, the project seemed to have still had these block structures. People try to move close together, but that didn't last very long just because of the way projects were organized. And then after a while, you know, you have strangers living next door and that is a very different kind of situation. It was a way for the government to keep people, you know, in a particular place um, and kind of control their lives and to control who lives there, control a lot of, you know, who stays there, how much money they can make in order to stay there. When you put people into those environments, when you put people and you concentrate them into pockets of poverty, you can't expect people to thrive in those environments. So they become, you know, pretty heinous um, and unbearable for a lot of the tenants. I mean, you, it takes maybe three or four people to ruin an entire, you know, area. So I, I love the way Ibram Marie Sims put this together as 
three periods in the life of the hill from 1930 to 1960. So that's a period when people have moved in, they're starting to make community, they're good industrial jobs, people are living in very tight-knit, very large social networks. So in, in theory, all the adults are, are overseeing all the children. All the children are in a social network, all the adults are in a social network. That begins to fall apart, it's torn apart by urban renewal, which literally bulldozes the lower part of the neighborhood and disperses the people, so it's torn apart by the state. And then deindustrialization cuts the economic base out from under the neighborhood. And in the context of those two upheavals, social relationships change dramatically. So she talks about 1960 to 1980 as, as what I call Sims 2, because I named it after her. So in Sims 2, social relationships are frayed. My colleague Rod Wallace talks about as, as you break, you break the ties that bind groups together, they crystallize out into groups by religion or race or neighborhood, smaller groups that don't like each other behaviors change because you have to manage that in a different way so you don't trust the people next door because they belong to a different group so the behaviors change and things like you don't have barbecues with your whole street so it, it makes it's different the street has changed but more things are happening so in the absence of industrial jobs drugs are coming in and becoming the great new employer plus a lot of people are addicted under those conditions there's a violence outbreak and People just are driven further apart, so more bonds are broken. The key thing that Rod Wallace talks about is that is, is behavior literally conforms to social ties. So if there are big ties, everybody's relaxed, everybody's friendly, everybody gets along. If we've crystallized out into small groups that are fighting with each other, people carry themselves in completely different ways that are appropriate for the setting that they're in. And that relates to everything, from how you raise your children, to who you barbecue with, to how you walk down the street. Everybody talked about how important the front porch was. And, you know, in the earlier generation, people, because the houses were so small, you know, most of them were two-bedroom ho homes with, you know, five, six, eight kids living on a very small footprint there, people would spend a lot of time outside. So public life, you know, was life on the porch and the kids would know they had to come home, be on the porch as soon as the street lights come on. That was like the rule. Um, but then, you know, in the 1980s, the late 1980s, uh, when gang activity began to pick up, the porches were no longer safe. In Sims 3, even Marie Sims quotes a young man who talked about unexpectancy. Said, I don't know what's gonna happen when I go outside my door. So I look to the left, I look to the right, unexpectancy. That's an amazing, terrifying thing. But imagine you have to go outside your door as opposed to like saying, oh, hi, hi, want to come over for a barbecue? You're like, oof, what's going to happen? That's a massive change in behavior, but it's appropriate. If you don't know what's going to happen when you go outside your door, you have to look to the left, look to the right. And now you're telling people who are a product and the effects of that. You're telling them to get up off your boot stop, go to school, get a good education, and you'll get a job. When we know for a fact that that's not happening. If we're going to call ourselves the most livable city, we should not only have access to it, but be able to actually move up within companies um, and take leadership position. Until that happens, we're going to be black people will be in the similar situation that we were in in the 1950s, and we're seeing that. You know what I mean? They're not saying like we're not being less educated, it's just like how can we afford education when we're not making enough money and it's this generational cycle of poverty that we find ourselves in that the city's not really talking about. All of these things are happening to neighborhoods. Neighborhoods can work with what they have, but what a neighborhood is going to have is not set by the neighborhood. It's set by the powers that be in the larger society. So if there's a neighborhood that doesn't have any resources, it's not the fault of that neighborhood. So these processes of segregation, redlining, urban renewal, disinvestment, deindustrialization, and gentrification have been like hammer blows falling on neighborhoods. 
This process is hard for people to understand because we like to kick around this idea uh, that people bounce back from troubles. If there's a disaster, people will recover. Um, but what, what's helped many people get what happens is what happens to the football players. So the football players, they get a head injury and they get up and they keep on playing. But then they die at age 50 of all the brain trauma that they've had. The idea that there's actually brain damage from concussions that accumulates and that kills people is a much better model for what we've done to neighborhoods. That's what really has happened. This is like you, you bang a neighborhood like that with all these policies and the neighborhood is very ill. So when, you know, we live and exist within these systems that are entrenched, I mean, they're not going anywhere. Um, so you do try to infuse other elements, agriculture, um, gardening, you know, both, both on a you know, macro and micro level, has the potential to, to be a game changer. It, it is a bit of a revolution that people are, are are staging when they decided they don't want any more grass. They're going to just plant food and, you know, a little bit of flowers. And If you're oppressed and you don't resist, you would just be crazy. If you somehow accept, well, we're terrible people, we deserve to be oppressed, you, you would just die. So that's not what oppressed people do across the board. What they do is they get together and they resist in all kinds of ways. So they resist through jokes, they resist through sabotage, they resist through uprisings. So. All of that involves getting together, getting organized, and then figuring out what to do about the oppression. It's, it's a dual thing. It's, you, you have to hate the oppression, because otherwise it strips you of your dignity. Um, and you have to oppose it. And we know there's institutionalized racism. We get that. We know that even within the funding community. People choose generally to give money to folks who look more like them. We get that. Um, but we, we have to deal with all of this at the same time, you know? <laughs> and it is, it's, it can be quite daunting, you know? That's why I, I regularly take a, a break because, um, you know, when you're looking at the political scene, you're looking at our educational, um, the incarceration piece, um, whew, it can be, you know, it just hurts your heart. It really hurts your heart um, to see all the inequities. But I say, you know, what helps me to get up the next day and do this work, to work on those inequities in health disparities and incarceration specifically, um, is the hope that it can be better. And that I have to believe that. Because if I don't have the hope, then I have nothing. <laughs>